I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut, to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is brought to you by Down East Magazine, the magazine of Maine. Visit NewEngland.com and Northeast Delta Dental. If you live in New England, you know what it's like to endure the dreary period commonly known as early spring. I'm talking about the raw, rainy weeks between the last snowfall and when the trees start to leaf out and the first flowers bloom. It's known affectionately as mud season, and it seems to drag on forever. However, come May, the sun's warmth and the greening of the landscape begins to beckon us outdoors. In New Hampshire, the White Mountains get less white and more green with each passing day. Hiking trails become passable, and the warming weather rouses resident wildlife from their winter homes and rolls out a welcome mat to migratory birds. It was into this brave new world that I met up with Dave Fachula, the owner of Guinea Fowl Adventure Company, for a short hike to Arethusa Falls in the Crawford Notch area. One of the many great things about visiting the Whites in spring is that the trailhead parking lots have plenty of space, and the trails themselves are much less crowded, especially the popular ones like Arethusa Falls. We offer through Guinea Fowl this loop hike, which is the Frankenstein Cliff all the way over to Arethusa Falls and then back down the Bemis Brook. That's about a five mile loop trail that we generally will do. Okay, right. And so what, what's Frankenstein Cliff? So Frankenstein Cliff is right behind us. Um, it's a large, <laughs> that cliff in the background. You, and you it's, can't miss it. You can't miss it from here. Uh, and it's actually not named after the Frankenstein monster that you might think it's named after. So even though it looks like a monster as you're facing it. So you see these conditions that are just really rocky, rooty conditions, even on a very well used trail. That's kind of all of our trails here in the Whites. Uh, people tend to think if they haven't hiked here before, that you know most trails like out west are either pine needly or sandy or have lots of switchbacks. Our trails really don't have switchbacks and we're just roots, rocks, and whatever the trail's been maintained um, by the folks who help us out maintaining trails. But it tends to be um, you know kind of intimidating for people because they come up here and they see these conditions which aren't bad, but if you're not used to them, you're like, whoa, this looks you know a lot less kind of groomed than people expect. So Tom, we're coming into a muddy section of the trail, which you're going to get a lot in spring conditions, right? Um, all these trails are going to be wet for at least a few more weeks. And you can see that you've got a whole, I mean, I can just pick up the water coming through the mud, but this is the actual trail, right? And so you, you might oftentimes think, oh, I don't want to get wet or I don't want to have to worry about balancing on the rocks. And you're going to want to go around where you see dryness, but from an erosion perspective and from the potential to step on, you know, growing vegetation on the sides of the trail. You really don't want to do that. Um, the rocks, most times, especially here on this trail, are very easy to navigate straight through the trail. Or in the springtime, you should always be prepared by wearing boots that have some sort of, of a weatherproofing to them. So if you got to step in mud, it's okay. Step right. in mud. Right. Step in mud, be comfortable, explore, but just make sure that you're not going off trail and either widening the trail that's going to create further erosion issues or potentially stepping on growing vegetation in the spring that could still be under some of the dead leaves from last fall. You might not even know it's there. So here we are May 8th. We're at 2,000 feet of elevation right now and you still have residual snow from the areas that are shaded by trees or the areas that were lower lying that accumulated more snow during the winter. Most of the whites right now still have a good amount of snow 
at anywhere above 3,000 feet. Mm -hmm, really? So something you really need to be aware of, right? Yeah, you have to be considerate of above tree line conditions and you have to be considerate of below tree line conditions at certain elevations. So it varies depending on the weekly weather. Like last week, the presidentials got almost 12 inches of new snow, but the rest of the mountains saw more rain. So here in the presidential range, well, we're in Crawford Notch, the presidentials are right back there. Um, there's snow from 2,400 feet up. We were walking on fresh powder uh, on Mount Pierce last Friday. What people don't realize is that the White Mountains is actually really in Boston's backyard. You know, we're only two to two and a half hours away from the city. Uh, you don't need to travel all the way out to the West Coast or somewhere super far to get the mountains, the forest, the trees, the rivers, the waterfalls. It's really all right here. So Guinea Fowl Adventure Company was launched in the fall of 2021. I, I decided that for the rest of my career, I wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to be helping people. Uh, and I wanted to figure out how those two things could be combined with my passions personally of trail running and hiking. We take people on guided adventures in the White Mountains where we provide all of those things to them. People need to get back in touch with nature and I thought this is a great way to combine all of those things uh, while offering a service to people to help them get outdoors and at the same time do what I love for a living. We pick people up in the morning, bring them up to the mountains, go on a day hike and get back to the greater Boston area in the evening. And then we also offer strenuous longer hikes for folks who really want to push their boundaries. Oh, we made it. Yeah. Arethusa Falls. Arethusa Falls, yep. The tallest single vertical waterfall in New Hampshire at about 140 feet. And it's in its glory right oh, now. Oh man, with, is it ever. With all the snow melt and rain we've been getting over the past couple weeks. I, I love guiding because I am a hyper extrovert and I love meeting people. Everybody who you meet when you're out hiking, when you're guiding, they're in nature, excited about experiencing something new, excited about being in an environment that they've always wanted to be in. That's just, we're so lucky to have and so lucky to be able to do together. Make sure that you're in tune to the weather. Use apps like mountainforecast.com to see what's gonna be happening at higher elevations. Make sure you understand that just because it might be 50 degrees and beautiful in the valley, it could be below 30 degrees with wind chill, with ice and snow above tree line, and so you have to hike prepared for that. For me, hiking, and especially hiking in the White Mountains, is about perspective shift. Everybody is caught up in our day-to-day -day world and caught up in our little clouds and our bubbles and our screens and our devices and all that stuff that makes everything feel like close. Everything feels so urgent and so necessary and so immediate. You look around and you see the vastness that is nature and you're this tiny piece of it, you know? And it shifts your perspective on how big everything is. And it's just a breath of fresh air. It's a perspective change that allows you to just recalibrate. I do this professionally now, but I still get that every single time I hike. And, and it's just like, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, this is what I do for work now, it's amazing. If there's one guy who knows a thing or two about White Mountain's trout fishing, it's Steve Angers, the longtime owner of the North Country Angler Fly Fishing Shop and Outfitters in North Conway. Steve's been fishing the Whites for over 40 years and knows the location of many hidden gems. Indeed, he even wrote a book about it, titled, appropriately enough, Fly Fishing New Hampshire's Secret Waters. It was that type of experience I was seeking when I joined Steve for a hike and float tube trip to Upper Greeley Pond, about two miles from the parking area off Kankamangas Highway. So Tom, what we're going to do today is we're going to hike into the Greeley Pond scenic area here. And there are two ponds, Upper Greeley Pond and Lower Greeley. Upper Greeley is actually from uh, the Ice Age. It's a scour pond, mm -hmm. and that's what makes this, you know, a really nice pond to come and fish. So you can, up. so you could come here in the middle of summer and still catch, catch brook trout. Right, right, right. If we if we were here in July or August, we'd be dry fly fishing. 
Oh yeah, so they, you, so they get hatches on these ponds? Yep, yep. There's very good hatches, there's excellent bug life, and that's why there's a, you know, a self-sustaining population of brook trout in here. So were the, so you're saying these are, are these native brook trout? Were they always there, or is it? This there? pond, we believe, is, yeah, the, the strain from the Ice Age. Really, so they were, they, they so were they, here. Wow, that's, ama with. that's amazing. Now, when you catch these trout and hold these trout, you'll know immediately that they're not hatchery gene trout. Mm -hmm. We're parked here, yep. and it's a little, oh, it's close to like a mile and three tenths okay. to, yeah. get, to get to the pond. Yeah, and so we're gonna hike, uh, pack in our float tubes and uh, and have at it. How high are we right now? We're over 2,000 feet. Yeah. I'd have to look. I'd have to look it up exactly. But the pond's going to be over 2,000 feet, and that's another thing that lets it stay cold for the trout. Right. Yeah. And so, when do you start fishing that this pond? Like, what, like, what's your now? Right. That right now is the time to start fishing this. So, pond. like early May, typically. As soon as you, as soon as you know that the ice has gone out, and we have a wind event to turn over the pond. Oh. So. The ice went out on this pond at the very end of April, and then of course last week we had the big storm mm -hmm. that turned everything over. So and why is it important to get the wind of it? Well, what happens in the winter time is the water stratifies, and believe it or not, water is heaviest at 39 degrees. <laughs> so the warm water in the winter is at the bottom of the pond, oh. and until, and then the sun, the ice will melt, and the sun will warm the top layer of the pond, and then the middle is too cold, so you need a wind event to flip all that water. And then, and then the top will heat, the bottom will cool, and then as the season goes on, the fish go closer and go deeper and deeper. As Steve pointed out, the farther from the parking lot the pond lies, the better the fishing, as few fishermen are willing to make the trek, especially carrying a float tube. That means more trout and typically bigger fish as well. Of course, big is a relative word in trout fishing. A brook trout that tops 10 inches can be considered a good sized fish when caught in small streams or tiny ponds like Upper Greeley, which is to say that I didn't exactly connect with any monsters. But floating around on a remote pond on a beautiful spring day wasn't exactly tough duty. This is Upper Greeley Pond. We finally made it. Yeah. I'll tell you, that hike was, uh, you know, strenuous in waders and lugging those tubes. Oh, it's it's but, a lot of work. But, but I guess it weeds out the part the uh, the, the part timers. Right? Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. You know, if you have to really be serious about wild brook trout, you if, you, if you're going to make that hike. Well, we're going to go out and get as far away from the shore as we can cast because we we're going to want to cast towards shore today. Yep. That'll be the warmer water in the pond will be near shore. And you're gonna start by counting to 10 and then strip your line back. And we're gonna cruise down till we get to the deep spot. Yeah. And if we haven't picked up any fish by then, when we get to the deep spot, we're gonna turn, turn around and cast into the deep spot. And then we're gonna to count to 15 and fish for a while, count to 20 and fish for a while, count to 25 until we find exactly where now the line that you have today sinks at three to four inches a second. Okay. So when you count to 10 seconds, that's like two feet mm -hmm. deep. Okay. And this fly that you've uh, selected for me, this the humongous? The humongous, this is a leech pattern and uh, it has bead chain eyes. So this is going to help you mm -hmm. get deeper as well. Mm -hmm. And then of course the marabou magic that's moving all over. Sure. And each time you pull that fly and then pause to pull again, it drops. All right. So be ready. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. And what other patterns do you like? To see? Well, we're going to use the little brook trout bucktail because there are young of the year brook trout in here and uh, the bigger trout tend to feed on, feed on those young of the year because it's an easy mouth full of food. So they're cannibalistic. Yeah, the, the brook trout are very cannibalistic. <laughs> and then after that, in your box, I gave you a bunch of different wet flies, old school wet flies. Mm -hmm. And we'll just keep going through the old school wet flies. Well, well I guess until... with, with two of us fishing, we can mix it up. You know, you try one pattern, I'll try another pattern until you figure out the magic one. All right, well, let's let's get in the tubes. All right. Check it out. Sounds good. Bar back in the pocket. So it's like go. sitting in a really cold barca lounger. Exactly. <laughs> so I was born in the White Mountains in North Conway, 
And uh, even though life has taken me all over New England, my dad and I always came back to the White Mountains to fish. And uh, I caught my first brook trout when I was six at Champney Falls, which we passed coming over today. And uh, when I turned 10, I started a fly fish. And when I turned 12, I started a tie fly. So it, it's been an all-encompassing thing for me. And it, I just love it. I just love, love it all, being in that pond and watching everything that was going on around and seeing you catch a couple of fish. That's, that's what I live for these days. When I wrote the book, Fly Fishing New Hampshire's Secret Waters, getting to go revisit all the places that I had fly fished in my lifetime, just to update the book, to make sure that those spots were as good as I remembered them, it, 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 was, it was a blast. It, I never get tired of, you know, catching three inch brook trout and little trickles to you know 20 inch brook trout in some of our remote ponds so yeah no I'm, I'm a brook trout guy through and through. <laughs> That's the thing about brook trout they live in beautiful places and when you want to go out and just relax after a stressful day nothing beats going out and, and trying to catch a brook trout. Well I, I say to people you can take the man out of the mountains but you can't take the mountains out of the man and I was born here, and my entire life I've been drawn back here to the White Mountains. I've been fortunate that my wife loves it here, my children love it here, my grandchildren love it here, so I'm, I'm a very fortunate person. <laughs> Nothing brings a bigger smile to my face as when a, a customer comes back to me after I've sent them out and said, Steve, we caught fish. Steve, the flies you told us were right. I had a person recently that had no idea of what they needed to go fish a trout pond, and I gave, the, gave him the flies for trout pond. I got an email that night. I caught the two largest brook trout of my life. Thank you so much. And that just exudes the passion when you can pass it on like that. You can throw every fly in the box and catch nothing. And, uh, and then there's times that you put one fly on and you never change it all day. So um, it's, it's really a mystery, but I think it's that figuring it out part of it that, uh, that keeps me going. So wild brook trout um, are a, um, an indicator species. They live in only cold, clean water. And back when I was a child, you could actually catch two and three pound brook trout in the Saco River in my town. And here we are 50 years later and the brown trout are having trouble hanging on in that section of the river. The reason I'm so uh, pro wild brook trout is it gives you an indicator of the water quality in a watershed. Now on top of that, my opinion, it's one of the most beautiful creatures on the planet. And when you're fortunate enough to hold that little jewel in your hand for just a couple of seconds, it, it just brings a smile to your face. It brings a smile to anybody's face that knows wild brook trout. So that, that's my passion, and I know that New Hampshire has the water quality to be able to you know, foster wild brook trout. From fish to fowl, creatures are getting more active in the White Mountains in May. But the region's vegetation is also springing to life. Foragers like Clay Groves and his daughter Zoe look forward to spring because it means return of wild fiddleheads and ramps in the local river floodplains. I met up with the pair on a warm afternoon, the air filled with the amorous croaking of American toads that were loudly procreating in a nearby pond. Ah, spring, and a young toad's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. It's fun telling my friends about finding um, all of the things in the wild because they don't have any idea on how to do it. Even some of them who live really close to here, like I can see their house, don't know where this is. And so it's really fun to tell them about it. Okay, so this is a really good place to find fiddleheads because it's a floodplain. It's extremely wet and marshy. Yeah, I noticed. So they um, <laughs> like to grow here. Also, there's a lot of leaf debris and stuff. So these are fiddleheads right here. Oh, like right under our nose. Yes. Yep. So these ones are fiddleheads. Uh, you can eat these ones. These ones, I wouldn't. They're fine. But, but they're they just a little too far along. Good. Yeah. 
They, they, what, they'd be too bitter or something? Yeah, they'd yeah. be less than tasty. Yeah, so these little guys that haven't like unfurled that yes. well look like fiddleheads, those would be the ones that yes, you want to get. Correct. All right, cool. Well, can you show me like how you go harvest one of these things? All right, so you just like snap it and like that. You did that in one nice smooth motion. You've obviously done this before. I have. <laughs> And you just so you just would like what saute that yeah. in some butter or something? Yeah, you could cook it any way really. Um, you can saute them, uh, bake them like a Brussels sprout. They taste really good that way. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, you can put them on a grill like an asparagus. You just douse them with cheese. I don't know that, but it <laughs> sounds really good. Well, that's what I typically do since I don't know how to cook. <laughs> you should learn. I should. I'll start with fiddleheads tonight. <laughs> So these are ramps, and what a ramp is, is a wild leek. So think like if, a, if an onion and a garlic had a love child, <laughs> it would be a ramp. I like and, that. And, and these are ramps here. And you see these nice wide leaves, nice green. Mm -hmm. And these are getting pretty old. These, been up for, these, are, these came up before the fiddleheads do. And if you don't recognize it, just, you can look at it. And I recognize them right away because I'm friends with them, but you may not. <laughs> you know, but you can, what you can do is, Take a smell of that. Oniony. Oniony, garlic. -y. Yeah, yeah. And every part of a ramp is edible. I was going to say, you can, can you eat, eat the. Right now, you can eat that. Just you like, could eat that. Yeah, okay, go ahead. sure. Eat that. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> Thanks, Clay. Oh, that's good. It's, it's really kind of sweet. Sweet, garlic. -y, spicy. spicy, peppery. Wow, that's really all good. All the things. And they grow in these nice little bunches. And when you harvest them, you can just pinch off a leaf, and that's the whole harvest. That's it, right? And the question is, do we harvest the roots, right? right? That's what you're going to ask. Yeah, I was, of course I was. So, and the answer is yes, you absolutely can harvest the roots. Uh, and we're, we're going to do a few today because, out. and a lot of people will get these bulbs and they will pickle them. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. But can you cook that whole thing like that, like every, in, a, in a saute pan or something? Every part of that's edible. They yeah. smell that root. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I, this is what I, yeah. I'm most familiar with seeing is the is right. the is the bulbs right. part of it. Now ramps are incredibly slow growers. It might take you ten years for it to go succeed to a full grown plant. Oh really? And so if you start harvesting and you're pulling up all these ramps, we're gonna do just a few today, by the bulbs, you lose your sustainability. But we're gonna actually harvest leaves today. You wanna to harvest a couple. Sure. That's really important too when you're harvesting these, you don't wanna pick See, there's two leaves on the stem. Mm -hmm. Just pick one. Just pick one, so that way it survives. That right? way it survives. So ah. Now you've got sustainable harvest. You can pick all the single stems you want here, and you're not going to wipe out anything. Ah. After we had gathered a bunch of fiddleheads and ramps, there was one last and very important step: eating them. And Clay had brought a propane stove for just that purpose. So the fiddleheads clean up all that brown stuff off of them. It's all edible. Normally. You could blanch them for a minute, then chill them, and then cook them. That blanching will kill the salmonella. Salmonella is the danger with undercooking fiddleheads. Oh, I gotta cook this for my family. Mm. Mm. That is delicious. Yes, spring in New England usually takes its good sweet time to arrive. But once it does, you tend to forget all about mud season, especially once you catch the first trout of the year or enjoy a local foraged meal, like the one Clay and Zoe prepared. Like most good things, spring in New England is worth the wait.